Sonic Super Special Issue 7. Issue 6 is the Issue 50 Director's Cut, while Issue 7 is... Oh, I think I understand why this wasn't on the timeline. Because it's apparently a crossover with, uh, some superhero comic. I think it's X-Men, but I don't see Magneto anywhere. I'll review it just for the last, but I do hope they explain enough about the superheroes so that I won't be totally lost. We start out with what I assume is a woman, with a cool hairstyle, whose name is Particle. A man in the shadow says that she claims the tuna transported her to an alien world. She says that the tuna doesn't work that way. If so, then how did he do that? How could you make a device do that by accident? The man says that the place she visited looked futuristic, and wonders if she could have moved forwards in time, even though Mobotropolis isn't futuristic at all, it just looks like a normal city. I misread that text blurb as, but I can't see now, because the how and how did look enough like an H. The tuner was designed to prove the theory of alternate realities, separated only by the frequency that they vibrate. I like that they actually brought that lore back, even if for a non-canon crossover. But it's inconsistent. First she said the tuner doesn't work like that and dismisses the possibility that she was sent to an alien world, but now she's talking as if it does work like that? Anyways, predictably she gets teleported in front of the Freedom Fighters. With Sonic mentioning that she looks lost, and getting into a fighting stance immediately saying that she's an overlander, while Tails looks scared. To my surprise, Particle somehow didn't hear them and immediately turned around to talk to them, even though she was right next to them when he was talking. Sonic wants to rush her, just because she's a human, even though he likes Nate. While a Particle absentmindedly goes on about how the energy readings she tracked originate from another locale, she still doesn't hear him? Is she deaf? Antoine agrees in Sonic's Overlander racism while also saying that she's a female is an important thing. And I kind of chuckled at Bunny actually scolding him for that. Antoine! Is that how you think of me? And Antoine for some reason doesn't get scared or worried about her outburst and instead simply says with a love-struck smile that he was merely remembering a bad experience he once had. And some text explains that this is an untold story we'll hear about later in a story that's actually canon. Well maybe it's this but it won't be referenced so... Then Particle finally notices them, commenting on how they're talking animals. And she says she doesn't want to hurt them, proving that she's a compassionate hero as well as not rude and racist towards people just because they're talking animals. So she merely stunts them with her magical device. Then Particle does a quick adjustment on a tracker and locates a power source she was looking for on the floating island. Wait, how'd she get there so easily? Anyway, she finds something with the silly name of a zoot shoot, and is surprised that she has a slide down there, feeling like she was in an episode of the 60s Batman show, before sliding down it, being glad that no one's there to see her make a fool of herself. How is she making a fool of herself by sliding? Is she really that self-conscious? I do like her so far, though. With that, she makes it to the Chaos Chamber, and just barely manages to stop herself from having a hard landing with the ground below by grabbing onto what was above her at the last minute. I like how she lampshades how terrible it was to not put a pillow below the tube or anything, thinking, whoever designed this place probably never even cracked open a copy of Architectural Digest. She then looks into the Master Emerald, and is stunned at seeing a... a... day glow? At first I misread that as day old, and days old. A day glow elephant man. Is this something I'm missing by not reading her comic? You'd think a text blurb would tell me about it, but instead there's no text blurb at all. Whatever, the point is she sees Mammoth Mogul and the Emerald really easily just by looking at it, which must be a real eyesore. And she wonders what the power source is, the Elephant Man or the Emerald. Of course, Knuckles shows up, and Particle correctly guesses that he's the guardian of the gem, and says confusingly that he must be dependent upon it as a power source, too. Two? Knuckles is still suspicious, but fortunately they shake hands, but unfortunately for Knuckles, he becomes relaxed with the touch of her hand and magically passes out because plot convenience. Or maybe that's just a power of hers that I'm unaware of. That seems like a pretty overpowered power of hers. I mean, she could take down anyone effortlessly with that. She then thinks there is up with something's wrong because she's yet to experience a reaction like his and wonders if he could be a mutant like she is. Well, she is right. But, first of all, she did experience a reaction like his. She made the others pass out. 
But then she says that she wished she didn't have to resort to such desperate measures. So first she talks as if she was really surprised making him pass that way. Now she's talking as if it was intentional. Anyway, she thinks to herself that now she's got less than a minute to adjust the tuner so that she can transport the power source she came in for. Because for some reason the tuner is a dick who thinks that it's nice to make her have a time limit. Is she gonna take both the Emerald and Lava? I guess so. She thinks that she'll let the doctor find out how it works. And just as I was proud of the comic for having her think instead of talking to herself out loud like comic book characters always tend to do, she starts counting out loud anyways. Then we cut back to the man she was telling the story to, saying that she didn't have a clue what she set in motion. And before she could excuse herself to the ladies' room, a woman comes in threatening everyone with a gun, asking what she's done to scold her? Turns out he fainted because she grabbed him so he wouldn't get hurt falling. Which I saw him falling and then her catching him because that was very confusing. I thought that she was an evil crazy woman who just rushed in with a gun, but it turns out she's just a doctor. Right when they need her, that was convenient. Then she gets knocked out too, and is called Agent Molly, with Particle worrying about the government learning about her abilities and using her for them. Then we see some people complaining about the power being out and the backup generators not being turned on yet, and the two people she knocked out are yelled at for letting Particle get away. She's also blamed for the power outage. Skulder and Mully? That sounds like a ripoff of Mulder and Scully from, I think it's the X-Files? I mean, you think that they would realize, hey, that's copyright infringement. Also, I hope these are code names, because otherwise their parents must have hated them. What kind of names are that? Skulder says because of Mully's analyzing of the situation, she's sounding more like him. And Skulder reveals that Particle may have been the only living being they found among the ruins at the airbase, but not the only evidence of other players in the game. Mully asks how an electronics repairman could possibly be involved in this case, thinking that he's too normal for it, I guess. And they question him and ask to see if his son has seen anything that could help him in their investigation. Oh, he's wearing a shirt with Archie's head on it. That's not arrogant of Archie at all. It's explained why Mulder and See, their names are so similar that I'm literally calling him Mulder by accident. It's explained why Mully and Skulder know about what happened the past weekend at an Air Force base. They found his father's business card there. Why was that there in a security monitor's videotape? The kid tells them that he saw a flash of light in an alleyway and saw a really tall, evil-looking vampire monster. A vampire monster? in front of the Freedom Fighters with the cape moving like it was alive, and he assumes that the Freedom Fighters were all kids dressed up like video game characters. I guess in this universe there are official Sonic games with Rotor, Sally, and Antoine in them. If only. Sonic asks the tall guy that no text blurb explains who he is to the audience, where they are, only for him to just disappear without telling him. Why the hell are the Freedom Fighters here? After Knuckles and Sonic get righteously angry at what happened, the kid in the alley, trying to get them home to their parents for being lost, is told by Sally that they need to find the Chaos Emerald immediately. They still call the Master Emerald the Chaos Emerald? But it's so much bigger and more powerful now. You'd think they would have given it a different name. The kid finally gets a clue. And Knuckles explains that he was in a hidden grotto on Angel Island, left unconscious until he felt some cold water. And since the island hovers above the clouds, he didn't need to be a High Council member to know something was wrong. Why does he think a High Council member, whatever that is, would have to be really smart? It would have made more sense for him to say rocket scientist. Anyways, for some reason, the island had fallen into the ocean. The island lost its emerald, so never mind, that does make sense. And everyone on the island was trying to cope with the disaster, and everyone on the island hadn't all immediately died from the flood even though it looks like the island literally tilted into the ocean rather than simply landing there comfortably, leaving him with no other choice. Sally reminds us that she used to be somehow childhood friends with Knuckles by saying that some things never change with him being reluctant to ask for help. She then uses Nicole to play back some footage she somehow has that's all green at that. You'd think she'd get better footage for how advanced she is. She explains that 20 minutes after their encounter with Particle, Knuckles showed up, and Nicole's sensors showed no signs of energy waves normally emanating from the Master Emerald anywhere on Mobius. 
We then see that Rotor found a vehicle that was abandoned months ago for some reason, and Rotor complains that he's yet to find any indications about his origins. They then got on it and magically teleported to the Cosmic Interstate just like that. It's a good thing this is non canon because that was too easy even for Rotor. Although it makes a lot more sense than interdimensional portals randomly showing up conveniently for them. Wait, I think I have an idea of who could have left that car for him. Maybe a person with a Z at the start of his name? Once they reached the interstate, Nicole started picking up readings a bit again. I'm really glad they're explaining why the Freedom Fighters got to where they were. I was really worried they wouldn't. Especially since there's so much to the al they also don't bother to explain, like who the hell that vampire guy was. The kid agrees to help them find the Master Emerald. And then he puts on a costume, saying that it's time for a Shadow Hawk. And his father knows about this? I mean, it looked like he put it on right in front of him. That's pretty novel for a superhero. I hope his dad isn't the type to reveal secrets easily, like Leela's father in Pajama. For some weird reason, Antoine mistakes Shadowhawk for a swap bot, even though he looks absolutely nothing like one. But fortunately, he doesn't cause a problem, like him being attacked. Wait a minute, if the Frame Fighters can locate the Master Emblem with Nicole anytime they want, why do they need him? It's not like they need a guide around town when they can just follow the trail of energy. Also, Antoine says Mon Ami with an S at the end of Ami. And that's that's wrong. He should be saying Maze Ami. Unless Mobius French doesn't have that kind of it changes to May rule. Nicole back in the car explains that using the electronic map grid she picked up on satellite transmission, she can display the locations of everyone else in relation to the Chaos Emerald, and continuously send the data to the onboard navigational computer. Good, they actually try to explain her powers for once. I guess she knows how to hack to get free Wi-Fi without a password or anything, and that's how she gets this info from satellites. Rorder then says that the computer is steering the buggy programmed by Nicole, and as they get to a Grand Central Station, the car faces right through a wall of solid concrete emerging inside the tunnel. And the tech supporter insults my intelligence by trying to insist that just because it's New York, nobody would notice this. New Yorkians aren't, like, magically different brains from other people. Also, we see a green man here who's so obviously a mutant that it's a wonder he wasn't discovered on site alone years ago. He immediately runs after the Freedom Fighters' car, running under the assumption that they're trying to cause trouble. Shadowhawks is a weird phrase, by the dragon. And Sonic cathartically insults him for it and says that Dulce isn't even here. I wouldn't know about her. Why is he saying this when earlier he said that he watched that AM, which Dulce was in? In fact, she was pretty well known since she was the Scrappy. It turns out that the green guy, I think he's the Savage Dragon, has started shooting at them wildly. Shadowhawk says that they can't board the train with the nut firing at them. And Nicole reminds everyone that the Master Emerald is leaving on that train. Shadowhawk yells at Dragon for almost killing them, as I wonder why he's called Dragon despite clearly not being one. And they get interrupted by Cycle coming alive and making a lot of noise. I guess it was caused by this red guy, Union, who I feel like is going to be completely useless and redundant here. Also, he seems like an arrogant dick. And I guess he only made that Cycle come alive because he wanted attention. They finally reunite with Particle with the Emerald. And she's surprised that the Doctor knew that the Freedom Fighters would go after them. How? Did he know about their magic car? And is the Doctor evil? He's smirking like it. He also says that he knows all about the Master Emerald and Sonic and his friends, and says that Knuckles will get to know him very well in the future. Please, no. He also says that Sonic merely lucked out in their past encounter. Past? He's never met him before. Fortunately, the three superheroes shut him up with a fight, and the lasers cause a light show from hitting the Master Emerald which shakes the train around and knocks the Freedom Fighters unconscious without killing them for some reason. The Doctor brags like a generic film that he'll use the Emerald to make a crisis on infinite realities, resulting in only one. His. I'm guessing he doesn't have a proper excuse for being evil either. The Doctor, who has robots reminding me of Shadow Swap Bots, says that he's using Particle for powers, she might as well let the government use her then, and complains about singing coming from a box. 
Then after Particle happily reunites with a girl, I assume it's, it's her sister for some reason, an another purple superhero shows up, and I can't help but feel like he's redundant too. And some more superheroes I don't care about fight, as I'm increasingly more irritated at the minor and helpless role the Freedom Fighters are having in this crossover. The Freedom Fighters woke up? Now finally Sonic is in to be useful, as he's told to use his speed to create a diversion while the other superheroes do the actual work. Fuck you. The worst part is that he's not the only one with super speed there, so he's completely redundant. I was really expecting that once the Master Emerald had been hit with lasers, it would teleport the Freedom Fighters back home and end this crossover. But sadly, it didn't, and we get it dragged out with some more pointless feeling fighting. Fighting colored voids at that. The artists were so fucking lazy with this page that I can't even tell where they're fighting in. The Doctor tries to use the Master Emerald to recreate reality to his will, sending everyone to a city and changing the way the city looks. And while some fights with robots start, Knuckles wastes our time by either hearing voices of his father in Demetrius' head or thinking about what they'd say hypothetically to encourage him here. I mean, if it's the former, how are they talking to him across dimensions? Other way, I'm sure the reader not already familiar with the Sonic comic wouldn't be very engaged at this. Knuckles, with that encouragement, uses the Master Emerald from a distance because he's the Guardian, and that defeats the annoying Doctor really easily while leaving a bunch of rubble. And the kid then explains to the agents that his dad didn't even know he had been gone, even though he just put the mask on in front of him. The agents say that the kid just made everything up from too many comic books and video games, and then the female agent says that maybe it was just mass hallucination brought up by microwaves through the total eclipse of the sun? Her explanation of science manages to be even more conspiracy theory ridiculous than the real one. This story was written entirely by Ken Penders, which really surprised me because I thought a crossover story would be a co-op work between a writer of one comic for the one comic's characters and the writer of the other comic for the other comic's characters, but instead it was just one person from one comic. And as I expected from my lack of familiarity with the other comic, which they didn't even bother to tell me what the other comic was called, it was torture for me. I do not care in the slightest about whatever franchise this was crossing over with, and the whole point of a crossover is to get the audience of one story invested in the other franchise, so I can safely say that this crossover failed at its job. Most of the superheroes seemed redundant and excessive and stole the spotlight from Sonic, as most of the Freedom Fighters didn't even get to do anything. This was a disservice to the Sonic comic in favor of the other one. I like how Nicole was really useful in a logical way this time around. And Particle endeared herself to me at the start of the story. Although her being tricked and manipulated so easily by Dr. Generic Villain over here made me feel like she was just an idiot. I appreciated seeing Particle's confusion at seeing the Sonic Universe as a fish out of water. But it was really annoying how she kept fainting everyone effortlessly, and barely stayed in the Sonic Universe at all to give us more of that, in favor of spending most of the comic in the boring New York full of humans and generic superheroes I don't care about. You know what I really hate is that but I think the reason I don't care about superhero stuff in general is because I can't buy the whole I have a secret identity that somehow no one has figured out who I am. That thing. I it just... It, it feels like too much of a fiction-y concept to me. Like, I just can't buy it. There's also the fact that there's a million superheroes out there in the media. There's so many of them. You think that people would get completely tired of them and sick of them. It's just like zombie fiction. It's the same story every time. Superhero fights bad guy. Keeps his identity a secret. I, so, it seems so cliche because it's so overdone. Not just in comics, but also in movies. It just, I don't understand why people want to see more of it because it, it happens so much and it's always the same thing over and over again. I'm just not interested in superhero comics. I'm more interested in Sonic where Sonic has a family life. Everybody knows who he is. He has a home. He He's fighting a villain and people know who he is and he's a hedgehog. So like I could believe in superheroes more if they were like humans but they were wizards or witches. But it said that they're just humans who have magic powers for no reason whatsoever, instead of inheriting it genetically. It's- th I can't buy it. I thought the story would end when Master Rumble was hit by lasers, but it just kept dragging on and on, it was so tedious. 
I wasn't invested in the other comic stuff at all. It should have mostly taken place in the Sonic universe. I wasn't really confused, just bored and frustrated how downplayed the role of Freedom Fighters was. In a Sonic super special story, mind you. I tried to like it, but thank goodness this was over. I brought it on myself by deciding to read it, but hey, I wanted to be thorough. I didn't want to skip an issue just because.